And when you have the internet, you can access anything. I'm saying like porn, inappropriate movies. And, and like when you offered to take us out, I was like, yes, now I get to see China in real life. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to my channel. This is Un Topo Por El Mundo. It's the first time I'm going to do the whole chapter in English, but this is because I'm going to interview my friend Henchi. She's from Brooklyn, New York. She's an Orthodox Jew, and as everybody knows, the series of the moment is an Orthodox, the life of an Hasidic Jew from Brooklyn, New York, who decided to live this style of life. So I'm going to ask Henchi, what she thinks about the series, and also what is her point of view of the life. So let's start right now with the interview. Henchi, welcome to Un Topo Por El Mundo. Welcome to my channel. It is a pleasure for me to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. I've never done anything like this, so if I make mistakes, forgive me. <laughs> so, Henchi, tell me a little bit about your life. Okay, so, I mean, like, my name is Henchi, for all those that are watching. And I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, and I am an Orthodox Jew. Um, what's a little unique about my situation is that I encompass a lot of different um, spectrums of the Jewish life. My parents both grew up in the Hasidic community. My father is from Williamsburg. My mother is from Borough Park, which is a community also in New York that's full of Hasidim. Um, I grew up with the culture around me, always going to my grandparents in Williamsburg. I speak fluent Yiddish. Um, but my parents got divorced when I was young. And when I was around 10 in like fifth grade, my mother started exploring other options in her life and she decided to stop being religious so she stepped away from the Hasidic world and Judaism as a total you grow up even if the your mother is not uh, Hasidic or religious anymore and your dad still is Hasidic and religious both of the things and yeah. you grow up as a Hasidic I grew up when I was younger, yeah. So the culture is always around me. I still go to Williamsburg. I myself don't define as Hasidish anymore, but I'm still very much involved. I actually work in a special needs school in Williamsburg. All my coworkers are Hasidish. I'm very much involved, but I don't live that lifestyle. So I lived in the Hasidish world until I was, I would say around, until around third grade. So I would say around uh, like eight, nine years old um and then when i was 10 that was when we started branching off but definitely still involved just stopped living like i stopped going to hasidic school um and i went to a regular jewish orthodox school how old are how old are you so i'm 21 years old and it's very exciting <laughs> time in my life when you mention you are not hasidic anymore what do you mean about it? Um, I don't live the Hasidic lifestyle, um, which is very much what Hasidic Jews are. It's a whole lifestyle of Judaism. And I am not part of the Hasidic community, except for the connections that I have, which are my family, like my father, my uncles, my cousins. It's Uh, create any problem between you and your family or or not um for myself no i didn't experience any of it my family is very open-minded and very welcoming we all see the differences um but i've continued going to family celebrations and it's never been a personal issue and me speaking yiddish definitely helps me being involved and connected with my family members have you watched the series uh, unorthodox Uh, that is the series of the moment? Um, yeah, so actually I wasn't even going to watch it until you contacted me about doing this. Um, I was a little nervous because so many movies and TV shows um, today's days that try to represent the Jewish world get so many facts wrong and always show the Orthodox and the Hasidic community in such a negative light that I kind of wasn't interested in watching the series. But then you contacted me and I was like, you know, I, it doesn't hurt. And I, I did watch it. And what do you think about it? How, how do you like it? So as a whole, like just watching the series, I think it was beautifully made. I think I was happy and cried in all the right moments. It was very well put together. The research, I think it's one of the most accurate portraying films 
Um, and there's a lot of symbolism and analogy between the Holocaust and everything that goes on. So I definitely appreciated the movie. I guess my only fear was is that it is going through a journey of a girl's life who decided to leave the Hasidic community and the Hasidic community has some cons that were showed in the TV show. And because the Hasidic community is so insulated and by themselves, so you don't know much about it, I was scared that the world was going to watch this series and now think that the entire Hasidic Orthodox community is like this cult and that like this is what they are and this is what they do. So that was my only fear. But on an overall, I think it was a beautiful movie. And when you watch the series, you can't, be identified by yourself in some point or you think like for example the main character there is Esty and maybe you can feel some things she also feels on the on the movie and you feel by yourself um so I think my mother who grew up Hasidic and felt those confines that Esty felt is definitely more identified for me Um, I was never involved so much like Essie was. Like, Essie only left when she was 19, 20 years old. Um, and I wasn't a part of it for so long. Um, her as a character and searching for who she is and searching for a path for herself, I think a lot of people can identify, like looking for that spiritual journey of what's for them. You know, at one point she was looking up on Google, like, is there a God? Like, I think everybody kind of has those questions and can relate to that. So, yeah, I think on a like on an overall level, there are certain things that I can identify or appreciate. But I think my mother would probably be somebody who would be more like, yeah, like I experienced that in the mikvah or I, I felt like I couldn't be myself. So in some point you distinguish between being Hasidic and being just an orthodox. What do you think is the difference between that two things? Um, so there's Judaism on a whole. And then there are different parts and different levels of Judaism, just like in any religion. But here it's a little more defined. So what is Hasidim? Hasidic, the movement of the Hasidic movement was all created by this big renowned rabbi. His name was the Baal Shem Tov. I think it was around the 17th century, but please don't quote me on it. I'm not a historian. But no problem, no. yeah, like, yeah. Uh, this is based on my own knowledge and memory. Um, so he wanted to create a space for Jewish people to really serve God with a spiritual and emotional connection and not just a learning. At that point, Judaism, for those that were religious, were mostly people who were study the Torah all day. And not everybody can learn. Not everybody's a good learner and not everybody connects to God through that. So he kind of created this movement where it was very emotional and musical based and you're really connecting through God with your soul, through music, through love and through all of these different aspects of life. And then what happened was is that all of his disciples would go to different towns and different places and they would become the rabbi of that town. So my father's side of the family is from the sect of Papa. What does that mean? It means that a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, generation after generation, went to this little town in Germany called Papa and he became the Papa rabbi and after and they were known as the Hasidim of Papa. You know, Satmar, the same thing. Babiv, that's how, that's how you get all these different names for all the different sects of the Hasidic communities. What they all have in common is the idea that they each follow an individual rabbi, and that's what makes them Papa or Satmar. But for the most part, they all have a lot of similar customs and everything in common. Now, outside of the Hasidic world, there's just Orthodox. What is Orthodox? Jews who believe in the Torah, believe in the rules, believe in the laws that were given, and they live their life according to, but they don't necessarily live the same lifestyle or follow the same rabbi that the Hasidic people would do. So we're the same equal in terms of religiosity, but our lifestyles are just different. But our rules and morals and the Torah is all the same. In your practical life, what do you, what do you do or what do you don't do that doesn't coincidence with the Hasidic life? So I definitely don't dress like them. Um, the entire aspect of what 
Hasidic people do is that they like to take, so let's say there's the line over here and they want to go the extra mile. They want to serve God with an extra vigorous energy. So they'll always take a step beyond what they need to. So the way we have like a modest dress code for the girls, elbows need to be covered, our collarbone, our knees, we can't wear pants. And we all do that. Not, none of the girls wear pants. We don't wear short sleeves. But the Hasidic people will go the extra mile by maybe wearing stockings. Like, they'll be more modest in terms of maybe they won't wear nail polish. They won't wear bright colored makeup. Nothing to draw attention to a girl's sexuality. But they definitely believe in being feminine and being pretty. And you can see, like, um, I don't know if the movie portrayed it so well. But, you know, you do dress nice. You do, We really believe in dressing put together and giving off a good impression. But just not being provocative. So in the Orthodox community, girls kind of have a little more freedom. Like I'll wear nail polish. Um, I may not wear like bright yellow, but I'll wear some nail polish and I may not wear stockings in the summer. So kind of like differences like that will separate between the Hasidic and Orthodox. A lot of it is a very custom and tradition and what the Rebbe tells you in the Hasidic world. So, you know, the men wear the strimals, the furry hats and the bekecha. It's really just a lifestyle difference. It's not a religious difference. Nobody is more religious than the other. It's really just how you dress and how you live your life that's different. And about your dressing, when you dress as a not Hasidic, but still Orthodox, and you go to visit to some of your relatives that they are still Hasidic, they can tell you something or they have ever said anything about your dress? So I definitely try to be respectful in the place that I'm at wherever I am. So I'm not going to show up in Williamsburg wearing like... A, a outfit that really will set me apart where everybody will be like well look what she's wearing um i dress modest usually throughout my my day-to-day -day life so there's not so much changes but maybe i'll make the extra effort to wear stockings and not wear my sandals instead i'll wear my regular pair of shoes just to be respectful of the environment that i'm in my family personally maybe growing up they would have said something but now they're just like you know we accept you for who you are do what you need to nobody's gonna look out other way actually where are you live in what city so currently i'm living in brooklyn but because of this whole corona academic epidemic i'm living at my mother's house with my two um Hasidish orthodox grandparents and my mother's house who's not religious but we have a kosher kitchen so it's beautiful um we're in rockland county so it's in new york but it's not near the city um how is your relationship with your mother that is not a uh, relation to not orthodox like what she does and what she doesn't do like she doesn't keep shabbat she doesn't she doesn't give kosher or so she's not religious in terms of everything she doesn't keep kosher she doesn't keep shabbat she likes still like the traditional foods that she grew up eating so like she'll make get filled to fish if she's in the mood she'll she'll love a nice bowl of chalent but she doesn't keep any of the things in the Torah. She doesn't necessarily believe in Judaism as a religion. And growing up, definitely, like, before I was in high school, it was hard because, like, we clashed a lot. Not so much, you know, our personalities were just very headstrong. Um, and there were definitely some, like, religious things that got in the way. But she was always very supportive of me being religious. And she actually would go to the extra mile. She's the one that got me into this um, Jewish boarding school because I wanted to be religious. And it was hard being at home where I keep kosher and they weren't. So she did all the application. She helped pay for my my high school. So always very supportive. Um, but definitely sometimes there would have been clashes. But right now, like, it's amazing. Our relationship is great. Have you ever had any doubt of your still of, of, your, of your life? And also any doubts about the existence of God or the Torah rules or whatever? Um, so I think I've definitely been blessed with my strong belief. I mean, I was 10 years old when I decided to stay religious because of my belief in God. Um, growing up, my parents got divorced. It was kind of tough. And the one person that was really there for me was, in my opinion, was God. So I always believed in him. There was always a very strong connection. Did I have questions? For sure. I questioned everything. Like, why do I cover my elbows? Like, why do I do this? Why do I do that? But it never hindered my belief. And the one beautiful thing about the Jewish religion is that questions 
are supposed to be encouraged. There are people that spend their entire lives questioning the Torah with every little thing. It's really about if you have a question, ask and search for the answer and you'll find it. You just might have to take a little more time. So my belief in God was never questioned. It's really just questions and looking for answers. And have you ever visited another Jewish community? Like no different, like uh, different Hasidic Orthodox. I mean, like uh, reform, uh, secular or conservative or progressive or whatever. So I definitely um, have relationships with people who are not Orthodox. Um, I have a lot of friends who are Jewish by identity, but not religious. Um, I actually learned with a girl who it comes from a more of a conservative reform background. So I definitely have friends from all different walks of life in terms of the Jewish spectrum. Um, and I love having friends from so many different walks of life in terms of the Jewish religion. It really broadens your hindsight and just lets you understand where people are coming from and different beliefs. Um, what opinion do you have? I, I mean, like, would you ever think to move to another Jewish movement? or ne it never appears on your head? I never not thought of being Orthodox. I've always wanted to be Orthodox. Um, did I think about moving to a different community that may be like more small and out of town and smaller Jewish communities? For sure, I'm not a city person, but I never questioned being Orthodox. Like it was, I believe so strongly in the Torah and all the guidelines that help us become better, that I don't think I would have been satisfied with my belief if I would have left and gone conservative or reform. Because you have seen in the series, the girl, Esti, she, from one day to the other, she starts to eat pork, she goes to a party, she, do a lot, she does a lot of things, and she always lose all the Judaism values. Like, she never said, okay, I'm gonna go to another community, I'm gonna try with going with a conservative or a reform, whatever, she let, she leave everything in the in the process yeah so i definitely like it's something that i've discussed a lot with my friends and it's very hard because when you go from an ultra orthodox community you know there are other jews out there you know there are other communities out there but whatever triggers you to leave it's stemming from something and you're looking to run away from it and a lot of people associate the trauma or whatever they go through with judaism and not necessarily the lifestyle. So with Esty, instead of looking at what she's been through, and you know what, like, I can believe in God, I want to be Jewish, it's just the Hasidic lifestyle is just not for me. For her, there was no separation between lifestyle and God, I feel like. And when she left, it was because she wanted to find herself and find something that doesn't define of the trauma that she's been through. Um, and you see that today, All a lot of the people who leave the Hasidic community, unfortunately, They don't explore the other Jewish communities. They just kind of go from like keeping Shabbat and now I'm eating pork on Shabbat, listening to music. And it also depends on, did you have that foundation and belief in God? Like, did Esti actually believe in God this entire time? Or was she just going through the motions of how she grew up? And then she was like, enough is enough. So I'm sure there are definitely people who grow up and just go with the flow. And this is how I'm raised. So this is why I do things without actually questioning like why if somebody is brought up with questioning why do i believe in god like why do i do this and get their answers then i feel like they would have more of a foundation to look beyond the lifestyle without leaving their faith and um, for example in, a, in the case of your mother she left the community and she now belongs to another jewish community or she left everything and she keeps some things no so she i mean it was a slow process but she definitely just like started becoming more modern and just left completely. Uh, my mother has been through a lot in her life as well, and I definitely influence, think that influenced the decisions, as well as there's a whole community of people who left. So they don't necessarily feel left out because, oh, I want to speak Yiddish today. Let me call out my other friend, Dina, who also left and speak Yiddish to her. So they kind of have their own little groups, but my mother found a place where she's happy and is content and... Um, she's happy with her choice. And she goes, for example, for the holidays, she goes to some synagogue or she doesn't go to any... No, she, she doesn't identify herself as someone who is religious or does any of the ceremonies. And your grandparents are alive. 
your mother's parents? Yeah, my mother's parents are both alive. They're actually downstairs. <laughs> they're both Hasidish, yes. Um, my mother's side, um, they're Hasidish, but they're a little more lenient. Like, um, they'll watch TV. They have like smartphones and iPads, but they still consider themselves part of the community and part of the lifestyle. Something in the series that a lot of people notice about it is the not using of the technology by the Satmers. But do you think it's something usual right now or a lot of Hasidic people is using technology every day? Well, it's, it's really such a big question. It's definitely been a huge topic in the Hasidic community as well. Um, the rabbis have gone out and said that internet is something that should not be accessible um, due to the fact that in Judaism in general, we have such strong morals and ethics in our own lives that to be influenced by the secular world is something that we don't want. We don't want assimilation. We don't want people getting confused by what we think is right. And when you have the internet, you can access anything. I'm saying like porn, inappropriate movies. And the rabbis really just wanted to keep that contained. They didn't want the community getting exposed and influenced by things that are negative, such as inappropriate language or inappropriate behavior. So as a rule, they're like, you know, really, you should not have internet. There are definitely Hasidic people who have smartphones, people who are working in the working field and need a phone. They have some, some of them may have computers and internet at home. For the most part, we try to limit it. Like the children maybe won't, they won't be watching on their phones all day. Instead, they'll be playing outside. I think that people have lived so long before internet that they're just living the same life that people did before internet came and took over. We also have to have in mind that part of that community, if you want to send your kid, if you're a papa and you want to send your kid to your papa Hasidic school, then the school might tell you, you know, like if you want your kid to be in our school, if you have the internet, then you need to sign a paper stating that, you know, I have internet at home, but it's filtered. So no inappropriate stuff can be accessed and it's all with supervision. So it's really about if you want to belong to the community, then you're going to follow the rules that are set. Um, but for sure, my father has a smartphone. All my uncles have smartphones. Um, my cousins don't have. It's really just like the older you get, the more freedom you may have to make that choice. But for the most part, we try to limit the Internet access as much as possible. I personally always had access to Internet and um, things. But what I could watch was very supervised. What I can read was very restricted. We didn't, my mom didn't, even though she left, she still wanted to keep an eye on it. But then as we grew up, we got more freedom. But my cousins, they don't have access. Like my cousin will ask me if she can use my phone to access her email or she'll go to the public library. As you get older, the rules kind of get more fluctuated. So it's not as simple. It is crazy because uh, if you go to New York, you will find the store B&H. Like the biggest technology store of New York belongs to the Hasidic people, but they don't use the phones at home. Yeah, so it's, it's, really, it's really interesting how the whole community works. And again, just like there's a spectrum in Judaism, there's a spectrum in the Hasidic community as well. So you can be like a really religious Satmar Hasidic guy, or you can be Satmar and be more relaxed and chill. I will, I will just put on context to the audience, like you came to Beijing, the celebration of Pesach, the Jewish, the Passover end, and I, I, a friend of mine came to pick me up to the synagogue and we were going out and I offered to you and another religious Orthodox girl to come with us to the disco and you said yes, but really surprised me. I don't know if we can say that anyway, we can edit it. It was very, I'll tell you what, like for me, um, it's not like my parents would have anything negative to say about going out and seeing the nightlife in China, but it was definitely uncomfortable for me when we went to one of the clubs. Like there was only one place where we actually like were trying to dance and it was so, I remember just feeling so uncomfortable. I was like, I can't dance with any of the guys. I'm dancing with my friend in my own little corner and there's this one guy coming and trying to dance with me and I'm like, please go away. And I didn't want to be rude and I didn't know how to say it. So I'm just like, maybe he'll get the hit if I walk away. Um, so yeah, so it's not something that I even personally enjoy. I don't think it's like a religious thing. I'm just not a club person, but it was definitely interesting to experience what people do. 
and I'm just not part of it. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I, I can I do thought, that. Then we went to the Latin disco from Beijing, Salsa Caribe, and that was a really unique and crazy experience also for me. I, I don't know if it was the first time for you going out to San Disco or not, or even want to say. You asked us to go out, and in my head I'm like, you know what, like, I, I hate organized tour groups. I hate it. I like going off on my own. I like seeing the place. I like exploring the little like nooks and crannies. And like when you offered to take us out, I was like, yes, now I get to see China in real life, you know, not just like, oh, here's a temple and the touristy stuff. Um, so I didn't even really like think much into disco. Like when you said like, going, I was like, mine was like, oh, okay, we get to go out and see it. So then we walk in and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like okay i'll go with the flow i'll try to dance and it's like mm, no maybe not but yeah it was it was definitely a fun experience and i i definitely wouldn't give it up but even when i do explore and try things that are different i always make sure to stick by my morals and the guidelines that the tour has given me if i went to the disco i made sure not to dance with the guys and i dance with my friends i'll never do something and try to overstep it because I believe in it so strongly, but it doesn't stop me from exploring the world the way I want to. Would I go to a club again? Probably not, <laughs> but it doesn't stop me from exploring. What's the first time for you? What's the first time for you going to a club? Yeah, first of all, when we met, I was 18 turning 19 probably. So like, it was my first time going to a club so yeah i was just like okay yay and <laughs> was, was, was the only one time or you went to another game um did i go again and we went to panama and we went to a small island called boca del toro so me and my friends went to get like a drink and then there was a dance in the background but besides for that i don't think i've ever gone clubbing quote and speak and i and i really don't feel comfortable with it like i walk in and i'm just like this is not my scene so uh, i said in my instagram we were gonna have this interview so they did some questions that i will ask you and you are free to not answer whatever you don't want and um, about the series they ask if everything that is showed there is 100% real and does it reflect the reality of the life over there? So the series itself is based off of the book Unorthodox by Deborah, right? Um, and she does mention that the TV series is a lot of fiction based on true fact and then there are certain components in it that are based on her real life experience. Um, but for the most part, it is a story based on true facts but our fiction so like a girl becoming a singer that that never happened well i will say is is that this series put in a lot of effort to try to get a lot of things accurate and they definitely got things more accurate than other movies and series that i've ever seen except for schissel schissel is pretty good the logistics i would change um the yiddish was a bit more formal um, Yiddish has definitely toned down a lot and he's become more like a Yiddish, I don't know, like a Yinglish, kind of like a Yiddish English, um, but depending yeah, on where you cool. live. So like if you live in, in um, if you live in Belgium, then your Yiddish is going to be more like German Yiddish or more like, yeah, yeah it's yeah, going to, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's really influenced by the place that you live. Um, another thing is, is that if you're part of the Satmar community, if you notice that when Esti got married, she wore this headpiece, which is called a spitzel. Most of the time, if you're part of the Satmar community and if you get married in a spitzel, then you don't wear a wig when you get married. You wear a spitzel. A spitzel is the turban hat that um, her mother-in-law was wearing, and she should have been wearing that as well. Um, Satmar people, for the most part, don't wear a wig. And the Hasidim that do wear wigs, um, there are different levels. So one will wear a wig and a hat. And then there are some people who are more laid back and will wear just a wig. But in this scenario, she should have been wearing a spitzel. Another thing is when a girl is shaving her head after she gets married, there are no children around. Um, that's something that's very private. And today, the Hasidic community is progressing. And there's a lot of things that are happening in the community that's changing. I think that a lot of what happened in the storyline can be true for people who left and there are people who've definitely experienced that but the community as a whole not the summer community Hasidic people as a whole um wouldn't i don't think would do that 
you know like i think it's very specific cases very specific scenarios and i don't think it's a general overview of what Hasidic people do when people leave and we saw in the satmar community they used to jade the hair the hair um and other communities like habat they don't do it and uh, i wonder what happened in the communities you belong like bobo or pupa they used to shave also the hair um shaving the head is something that's been passed down um in europe when they were during the pogroms there would be sars and people come in and try to rape the jewish women so as a stance against that people would shave their hair so they wouldn't be pretty anymore so people wouldn't rape them um and another aspect is is just the idea of covering your hair when you get married like i said earlier hasidic people like to serve god with an extra step something that's beyond they don't want to just do the minimum they want to do more than that so they took the step of covering their hair a step further by shaving their head and it's really something you only do if your mother does or if your husband specifically comes from a family who does it but there are many hasidic women who don't shave their hair if the day of tomorrow you will get married and if you will wear a wig yeah I'll wear a wig. I won't I won't shave my hair. <laughs> I like my hair. Uh. Um but I think like keeping my hair long wearing a wig is super hard. So I'd probably maybe cut it shorter just to make it easier to wear, but I definitely would wear a wig. Yeah. But I the wigs that you see in the TV series, there there's so much more beautiful ones out there. Not all those wigs look like Estes and today's days nobody's wig will look like that a lot of them have it styled with highlights and curls orthodox women take very much pride in their wig and will spend tons of money on it to make sure it looks beautiful so my wig will not look like Estee's wig in the series uh, you always think to get married with uh, i want to ask you a jew or non-jew because i think it's going to be jew but also you pretend uh, you expect your husband will be a uh, orthodox jew yeah um in terms of the whole dating and being jewish is that there are so many different kinds of levels of how orthodox or religious a boy is and when you get married you want to make sure that you're on the same page you know if I marry somebody who's not religious and I'm orthodox. How do you raise your kid? It can create a lot of conflict. So what we try to do is, is that we try to find somebody with that same desire. It's like anybody who gets married. You want to share the same goals. You want to same share the same ideals and philosophy. And if you marry somebody who has different opinions on how to raise your child or go about your life, it's a little difficult and can create conflict in a relationship. So when I'm looking for a husband, I'm looking for somebody who will share that same level of orthodoxy and desires and future goals. I have another question uh, related with the people made and somebody asked me if you think the serious and orthodox was uh, respectful to the Judaism or to the Hasidic world. I think that this movie was the series was created for a purpose. Somebody Deborah wanted to share bits of her story and stories that people may have gone through and she wanted to share that with the world because it's a journey that people have taken and it was done in a very respectful manner um but it's definitely a story where people had a negative experience with the Hasidic community so it's not a disrespectful movie but it is a story of a girl who left the community for specific purposes um it was beautifully well made and that ending where her husband Yanki comes and he's like look I'll cut off my payas for you and she said stop don't that was a very respectful move i think that was so amazing of the directors to put that moment in there of showing she's showing respect to yanki like don't take off your religion for me you have your beliefs and i'm just finding my own and it doesn't mean that yours is wrong but i do want people to understand when watching the series that what we've been talking about this entire time there are so many different kinds of hasidic people out there and not everybody goes through a story where they want to leave so many people are happy in the hasidic lifestyle that they live and are so joyful and are so inspired by the lifestyle that they lead that they're not tempted by the secular world so i think that part i want to share like that was the whole goal i think of me doing this interview of just letting people know that There are Hasidic people out there that are happy, who are not getting abused, who are so family oriented, and they just really love their life and their faith and their lifestyle, 
And unfortunately, just like any other community or religions, there will always be negative stories where maybe a priest has raped a boy or, you know, being Jewish doesn't mean we're good people. It just means we're people who are trying to live by the book that we believe in. My teacher actually said growing up, never judge the Torah by the people keeping it because people are imperfect. But for us, the Torah is perfect. And we're human and we make mistakes and we're not guaranteed good people. You'll meet a Hasidish person who might be mean and you'll meet a Hasidish person who might be nice. It doesn't make us better people, it just makes us the people who decide to live by their faith. You said the moment he cut the pages, and for me, it was the hardest moment of the movie, of the series, uh, the most emotional. And I think in that moment, Esti should came back with him. That was, I wanted, But I don't know if you had the same sensation, if you want that, or you just believe another thing. There was definitely a part of me that was like, Yonki's willing to change for you and go with him. You're going to have a baby, like try to keep your family together. But then I took a step back and I realized that, you know, she has so much soul searching to do. And Yonki, I don't, he was ready to ditch everything that he had in his life just to fix his relationship with her. And I think that eventually he would resent giving up what he believed in for her. And I think she would may resent him for coming along. Like, I think that they just needed that time to become their own person, to Yankee, to see what he wants to do with his life. Nobody should be able to, nobody who has true faith would be able to say, you know what, let me change for you. You know, and that's not healthy. Nobody should have to change that part of themselves for a relationship. So I'm glad that they took their part. I think the hardest part for me was that she had a relationship with someone who's not Jewish, especially because there's so much analysms and like parallels to like the Holocaust and everything that happened. And like, you know, her dating a non-Jew is the assimilation of what so many Jews are suffering from today is assimilation. You know, so many Jews are marrying out of their faith and You know, we may not be in a Holocaust losing six million people, but there's so many people who, you know, their family lines are getting cut off. And what do you think, like, in, in some point, in th that argument of not mixing Jewish people with uh, non-Jewish people, some people believe that it is a kind of uh, Nazi concept. We have a very specific way we live our life. We have very specific things that we believe in and the way we act. People are not being or trying to be rude by saying, you know, I don't want to mix with you because you're not my same type. It's just they're so content. Well, let's OK, let me break this up. The Hasidic community itself is very insulated. And I think the TV series made a very good point. The Hasidic community that exists today is recovering still from the trauma of what happened to them from the Holocaust. And Oh, the lesson they learned is that you can't trust society around you. Germany was considered the most polite and like respectful society. And this whole country turned on them and really traumatized them to a point where after the Holocaust, the few Jews that survived, they didn't know who to trust except for each other. So they created a community where they can rely on each other. We have our own shops. We have our own food. Not just because we don't want to go to non-kosher foods, but we keep kosher. So that's not going to help us. So we need to create our own. So they really created a community where they can rely on themselves and depend on each other. Now, to intermix with a community that doesn't share your same values, that can be a threat to them. Um, as well as the fact Judaism as a whole, I went to a non-Jewish college. I know a lot of people who aren't Jewish and we've been friendly, but to become best friends with somebody that doesn't like, I don't curse. I don't like cursing. I don't like that environment. The entire secular word curses. I don't want to be around. I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm going to hide in my room and not talk to people ever again because you curse. But I don't want to take away that sensitivity of getting used to it and then using that language. So it's not a matter of being rude. It's just like if you go to a Hispanic community or Chinatown, in New York City. Are the Chinese people being rude for keeping their language and sticking to their community and the things that they like? Then let's get rid of Chinatown. Let's get rid of any Hispanic community or black community. You know, people tend to stick with the people that they that share the same values and we go out and we work in society. The Hasidic community, like you said, they own B&H. Like, we do what we need to do. We go into society, we, we're respectful and we try to do things the way 
you know, society works because we need to do that to survive. But when it comes to our own personal life, we like sticking to people that have the same morals and values as us. And also, soci secular society was not very welcoming. Um, you know, in the 50s, there were signs that said Gentiles only, no Jews allowed. Signs that said no blacks, no Jews, no dogs. Like, so it's not like we're cutting off. Society kind of set us up for that. But this happens in the 50s. What about the 21th century and the 2020? You can't just delete so much history and then expect in 10 years everybody to kind of change. So things have definitely progressed. I've tried. Like, I went to a non-Jewish college, and I've definitely tried being friends with people who weren't Jewish. And it was great. We would have fun together. We would be friendly. It was great. But there was no, like, they didn't understand where I was coming from. You know, I was just viewed as innocent and naive and just ignorant. But I'm not ignorant, naive, or innocent. I just have certain ideals that the rest of the world doesn't agree with and I have my good friends I went to Jewish school I have my best friend why would I look for other people when I have the people that I love and care about I have a new question as it happened in the series the family of Yankee knows everything that is happening in the intimacy they ask me if it is common into the Hasidic world <sighs> okay so I'm not married so I'm not going to make a statement and say that this happens in every family. I think that what happens is, is that it's common sense that if a newly married couple is having trouble with their sex life and they're not comfortable with sharing it with anybody else, of course you're going to go ask your mother, like, am I doing something wrong? What am I doing? It's like anybody going for dating advice or marriage advice. Esty was definitely shocked and taken back, like, what, you shared something so personal with your mother? And I completely understand that. And I agree, you know, like relationship issues should be dealt between the couple. But I think that Esti and Yankee didn't have very good communication skills. And also Yon Esti didn't have anybody else to talk to about it. She just wanted to leave the relationship. So Yankee going to his mother and telling him, you know, like it's already been two weeks from our marriage and we haven't had sex because we're ha Esti's having issues. Who else would you turn to? So I don't think that it's normal for every Hasidic family to be so involved in their children's intimate life. I just think it was, you know, maybe people have experienced that, could be. I'm not saying not. I just think that it made sense. Like, if there's nobody else you can turn to, you're going to ask your mother. People ask me also in the Instagram questions, like, if the Hasidic people only have sex to procreate or also people have sex to have any pleasure. So let's talk about sex. So the Jewish view on sex. So basically, the Jewish view on life is that the world was created for each of us to enjoy. Take pleasures into the world. You know, we're not like certain religions that say don't drink, don't do certain things. To enjoy the world, just use it in a spiritual way. So I can enjoy an amazing steak with mashed potatoes, but I'll say a blessing beforehand, uplifting something that's so physical that I'm going to enjoy it into a spiritual aspect so I can enjoy the physicality while bringing it up to a spiritual movement. In retrospect, in terms of sex, sex is important in any relationship. Relationships are meant to have a physical component to it, and it's not just to have babies. And there's a separate mitzvah, which is a good act for men to have children. The obligation is not on the women. It's really just on the men. So we don't need to have children if we don't want to, but the guys do. Even when a couple gets to a point where they can't have children anymore, they should be having sex because if you want a healthy, stable relationship, you both need to find pleasure in each other. And the Jewish, the Jewish ideal of what sex is, it's not sinful. It's not bad. It's not something that should be hidden away. It's something that's beautiful and intimate and it's something that's so special and that's why women and men don't really touch each other up until they get married because we understand how special that connection is so nobody should walk away from this video saying that Hasidic people think that sex is something that they only do to have children or they think it's really bad so they just quickly do it under the covers and get it over with we really take pride and care in our sexual intimate relationship and it's something that's very important there may be some ultra-Orthodox people out in the world that don't recognize how the how Judaism really views Judaism, and maybe that's 
why so many like there are certain people that are experiencing that confusion about what they should be doing but what the torah represents and what judaism represents sex is something that's very special and should be taken with a lot of thought i have another question related with sex that we are talking about it some person asked me what about the homosexual relationship and how does the community manage it <sighs> I don't want to say the wrong thing. I really don't want to step on anybody's toes. So I'm going to try my best to answer the question where nobody feels bad about themselves or bad about religion. And if I say something wrong, um, please forgive me because I'm not gay and I was never put in that position. And I can't imagine how hard it is. Um, I can only speak from my experience as a religious Jew and what the outlook is. And so please have an open mind. Judaism as a whole does not condone sexual behavior between two of the same genders. And I'm going to repeat that. It's the sexual activity that's the issue. Um, I think that there is an understanding that God created people who love the same gender and they can't help who they love. And they're put in such hard positions. If you're brought up, in a religious Jewish home and you are gay, I can't imagine. Like, it's the most hardest thing that anybody can ever ask of somebody. And it's hard because if you want to be religious and you want to be an Orthodox Jew, you have to fight the temptation of loving another man or a woman loving another woman. And you have to try to move on with your life without having that love that you desire. That being said, the Torah also values somebody who has given up their love and their temptations for the Torah. They're viewed as holier than a rabbi. You can choose the holiest rabbi in the community and you're holier than that because we understand how hard it is to overcome desires and temptations and internal love. If you are openly gay in an orthodox community, it is hard. And I'm not gonna lie, you may not be accepted and you're gonna face a lot of hardships because people are uncomfortable with it and don't know how to respond to it and don't know how to handle it. And it goes against so, something so ingrained of what they believe in. And as well as if somebody wants to be openly gay and date, they may not want to be orthodox because they know if they're orthodox, they're not gonna be able to act on their feelings. So. There's not that many people who are orthodox, open, gay, because you're either choosing to be orthodox or you're choosing to act on your feelings. So there's not that many issues. There are a lot of gay Jews in the world and there are organizations, religious organizations to help you find a place in the community and figure out where you can let your faith still play a part in your life. Um, and I actually had a friend growing up. He was actually an next door neighbor when I was in Maryland and he was gay but he was modern orthodox and jewish by identity so he loved his judaism he believed in god but he didn't practice what the torah said and he just you know he's open he's gay and he lives his life the torah says don't judge and many people unfortunately judge and we're human but it's not my place to judge someone on what position they have in life and what their relationship is with other people I'm not God, it's not my place. If somebody came to me and said, you know, you're, I'm gay and I'm Jewish and I want to be your friend, I'll happily say, okay, great. Like, what you do is between you, God, and the person you're with if you believe in God. Um, so that's that's my stance on it. Uh, talking about marriage and the things, in the day of tomorrow you, would, you want to get married, what are you going to do? Are you going to find a person by yourself or are you going to wait for your, your father gets some shida? I'm going to walk oh, down the shida. aisle and whoever shows up... I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> so a lot of people have this idea that Orthodox Jews have arranged marriages. And in their heads, the woman shows up, the man shows up, and ba-bam, they're married. That's not how it works. Um, so, And there's many different ways depending on how orthodox and where you lie. So let's start with the Hasidic community first. The way a girl or boy grows up in the Hasidic community, they're so close-knit and they're so family-oriented. And their parents and them have amazing relationships. 
Again, this is talking for a typical healthy family with healthy family dynamics, with healthy beliefs. Um, we're not talking about somebody who may be divorced or going through a hard time or doesn't know where they're at. For the general healthy Hasidic family, the children and the parents have such a great relationship and are so open with each other that the parent really does know exactly what is good for their child. And their child trusts their parents to make the right decision for them. So how does it work? When the child comes of age, the parents will start listening to people's suggestion. You know, maybe that next door neighbor heard that his son's granddaughter's son, you know, may be a great person for your daughter. And what they'll do is they'll take this information and they'll research them. They'll be like, what kind of boy is he? Is he a good person? Is he a kind person? They'll call his friends. They'll call his, you know, his family members. You know, like, what kind of person is your brother? Like, is he a good person? Like, what does that mean? Um, what does he do for a living? They'll find out all of these things. Does his family share the same values as our family, as my daughter? Is my daughter going to share the same values as him? So you do all this research beforehand. So if you want to know how old he is, you'll already know. You're not finding that out on a first date. Let's say if you went on a first date, these are all questions you would ask that person. But this is all research done beforehand. So what happens is, is that when they do their first date, which is called a show, where the girl or the guy will come to a family member's house the parents will go away and it's kind of like a first date but instead of going out to a restaurant they're doing it inside their living room in the comfort so it's more comfortable um, and they're more at ease and the couple will now talk and they really just need to see if they're attracted to one another and if they can get along and if there's chemistry and if there's conversation flow because all the other information has already been known and then you'll do that once or twice and then they will decide if they want to get married. So it's not forced and it's not something that is like you need to marry him or not. They do have a choice and they do have the option to say yes or no. And if it's no, then they'll go on to the next suggestion. And then in the Orthodox community, um, they incorporate that same idea of a matchmaker where, let's say for me, I write out like a little resume of a little bit about myself, how tall I am, What's my job? What do I do? What am I looking for? What are qualities I'm looking for? Kind of like a dating website profile, but on a piece of paper. Yeah. And then I'll send them out to some matchmakers and I'll call and the matchmaker and we will have a conversation about what I'm looking for. And they'll see if they know anybody that's worth it for me to set me up with. And then if I agree to the match and he agrees to the match, then we'll go out on a proper date to see if we like each other. And we might be dating. So some people like my friend dated for six months and then I have a friend who dated for a week. It's really just when the couple feels ready to take that plunge to get married. Um, there's still a level of research that goes in on it. So we don't feel the need to date so long. Also, because a man and woman can't touch in Judaism, we don't want to date for long. Because if you're dating for a long time and you can't touch the other person, like, have fun with that. It's not for me. <laughs> and some people ask me also about the Zionist and the Israel state through the Hasidic community. I know this is the hardest question. <laughs> I, I will I will put in context to the people to understand the question because it, into the Hasidic community is a movement called Naturei Karta that believe that Israel state shouldn't exist until they are arriving. Let me let me stop you right there. They are a okay. cult. They are not Judaism. Like the Nakarta, everybody, even the ultra orthodox Samar people understand that they are a cult. They should not be associated with what real Judaism is all about. Nobody agrees with our methods. Nobody likes them. Nobody wants to be them. Like my mother has a very close friend actually who used to be a part of it and she escaped. Um, but yeah, no, 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 nobody that's out. Like I give you permission to think that they are not doing what they're supposed to. Um, Unfortunately, they've taken the Torah and they've taken it to such an extreme to a point where it's not even Judaism anymore. And most Orthodox people will agree that they are not doing the right things and nobody supports that. What I do know is, is that Satmar on its own have a belief system where when it, it all ties down to what happens when the Messiah, the Mashiach comes. We believe that God will give us the land of Israel and it will be run by a religious government and 
we will be able to be ourselves and have access to this beautiful country. Now, because the government right now is not being run by a religious government, the ultra-Orthodox group of people who are within the Satmar community don't believe in the state right now because they don't believe that it's ours yet. Saying that, a lot of Hasidim go to Israel all the time. I spent two years in Israel, come around the holiday time. It's like the entire Williamsburg picked itself up and placed itself in Jerusalem. Um, I don't think everybody has that extreme view on like spitting on Israel when Maisha went into the the like hotel yeah. and was like, is right it's yoni me like psh, no i'm from new york you know i don't i don't think people as a general have such a view yeah uh, do you think talking about moishe do you think the community has many moishes i mean like people like him it's funny because i spoke about this with my mother because watching this series this was the first time i really experienced a character like moishe where he grew up hasidic he left the community and when he came back his view was kind of twisted like he would go and jump into a freezing lake because of the mikvah but then he would go hang out with strippers and then like he kind of had this predator look where he was like hungry for like for something like weirdly evil like i don't know he, the character freaked me out i think that the actor portrayed him very well um to the point where i just was creeped out by maisha and if i ever met him i would want to be like Ugh, please go away. Um, I think that I'm sure there are people out there that have left the community, came back, and their view on Judaism is a little warped, and they didn't come back a better Jew. I think they came back with a twisted view on what Judaism and what the Hasidic life is all about. Um, so I do think there are Maishas out there. I just have never met any, and I really hope not to meet any, and I pity them. I feel bad that they couldn't come back with a positive view on what they're joining. Okay, I have the last three questions. We are having talking like for almost one hour and a half. That is crazy. It's a fact between the whole Jewish community. It doesn't matter if you're Hasidic or not Hasidic or whatever, we talk a lot. The three questions are from the people of Instagram, my followers, that I invite everybody to follow me on Instagram and YouTube to be subscribed. Your pupils. <laughs> I, the Hasidic I, of Fible. <laughs> so, one question is, would you like to leave your practice just for a while, like a little bit, like say, okay, one day I am not Orthodox and I do some things that are a little bit forbidden. No, to eat in pork maybe, but something that... I actually thought about this question because a couple years ago, my rabbi started off a class and he's like, if you can leave Judaism for 24 hours, what would you do and why? You know, I'm sure that there are things listen i would love to be able to put on a pair of jeans in the summer and wear shorts and not have to care about my sleeves and do certain things that are not part of my daily routine but when i thought more about it and i thought about why am i giving up 24 hours like i just i was i'm just not tempted like i'm so happy with my life and with everything that i believe in and i believe in everything i do that i don't think i would be happier in 24 hours and just like just leave it and and do that so you know even like when i went to bocas like in panama i think that's the most where i might have thought about doing it you know like i'm on the beach all i want to do is be on the beach all day like chill like do things and i realized that like it's not me it's not it's gonna give me immediate pleasure but in the long run i'm gonna regret it so as an overall no i wouldn't leave for 24 hours well, we have something in common that we I didn't mention to the audience is we usually don't speak in English, we speak each other in Yiddish. That is the language from the Ashkenazi Jews. Being Hasidic, most of the Hasids keep it in the whole society, but also people who is not Hasidic like me, we still speak the language and it's very beautiful to speak in Yiddish with people that grow up with with it. And the question is, like, you think the Yiddish will be extinct on the on the future or if it's going to be kept by the Hasidic uh, community? I think that Yiddish will not be like Latin. I don't think it will be uh, an ancient or um, extinct language. Um, and that's due to, first of all, there are so many Hasidim in the world that are speaking Yiddish. And it's not just in America. The Belgium Jews speak Yiddish. There's Yiddish in Jerusalem. You know, the actor that plays Maishi is actually an actor from the Geula Meir Sharem area who grew up Hasidic and he speaks 
Yiddish, you know, there's so much Yiddish in the world, as well as there's such a big Yiddish movement. Like, there's Yiddish theater in New York City, there's Broadway, um, The Fiddle on the Roof came out in Yiddish. You know, there's so much Yiddish going on just as a culture in itself. Colombia has a whole department just dedicated to the Yiddish language. Um, so I don't think it will ever really truly be extinct as long as the Orthodox Jewish community is alive. I don't think Yiddish will ever be extinct. And some Yiddish words have actually infiltrated the English Webster Dictionary. Like words like schlep, words like knish, meshugana. Like all of these words you can find in movies and scattered about in the dictionary. And they've kind of become a part of American culture as well. So I don't think Yiddish will truly be extinct. Well, here in Argentina, we have only one word in our slang that comes from Yiddish, but it's a not really good word. We, we use here, people don't know that it comes from Yiddish, we use tuches. <laughs> Seriously? Tuches is no. the word that comes? Yeah, 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 it's in the slang here, but people don't know it comes from Yiddish. But it's so funny that that word is part of like, Argent like Spanish Argentinian culture. Like, I didn't yeah. know that. That's so cool. Yeah. And the last question of the this beautiful and amazing interview is, uh, have you ever feel any discrimination for being Jew or even a discrimination into the Jew with Jewish communities for being Hasidic or other Orthodox? Unfortunately, um, anti-Semitism has actually been rising in New York City. A lot of Hasidic Jews are getting beaten up. Um, it's been on news consistently before this coronavirus. Um, a guy not too far from where my mother lives got stabbed and he actually died. Um, so anti-Semitism is very much aware. If I personally have ever felt unsafe for being a Jew in America, I have never felt unsafe, but I've definitely experienced people who are naive and don't necessarily know a lot about Jews, which to their own right, there's not so much out there unless you research it yourself um, for them to know. But comments like, oh, Jews are so rich and like all of them are rich, like, I worked all throughout high school, you know, like I'm not rich. I'm far from it. My family, we actually grew up poor and we actually worked our way up and worked really hard. Not every Jewish person is rich. Henchi, thank you very much. This was amazing. Of course, be welcome to Argentina. If I stay here for a while, when this coronavirus ends, I have to get back to China. I hope it's happened soon. And I have to meet you in New York and going around the Hasidic community together and good, also a good video about there. I'll definitely take you around Williamsburg for a good plate of chill it. And thank you for having me. Like, I had so much fun. If you ever just want to do any other videos, like, I'm so down. I had so much fun. And any other questions, like, for sure. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for having me and asking me. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the audience. And we see each other in the next chapter of Un Topo por el Mundo. For all the people who are watching, thank you for taking the time to listening to me speak. Please don't take whatever I had to say in a negative way or think that I am like a wizard who knows everything. Definitely do your own research. I could be wrong. There are people out there that probably experienced other things. And it was so much fun sharing my knowledge with you. And yeah, in Yiddish you say, Agitin Tug. So, Shkoyach and thank you. Agitin Tug. Shkoyach, Hashem and Dank. Mir wird reden euch Yiddish die Kommunikation Zeiten. Es gewinnt sie lag ganz schön Yiddish. Sei mir gesungen, ein Dank für alle Menschen. Thank you.